Good evening. Good evening. You here at Virginia Avenue Park. Good evening in Zoomland. I'm Janet Gallery McKithen, and I'm a member of the steering committee for the Committee for Race for Justice, and I welcome you here tonight. I'm excited that you're here. You could be anywhere, but you chose to be with us, and I'm very excited about that. This is our 12th year, uh, and we especially want to welcome those who are joining us for the first time. Welcome to the Committee for Racial Justice. I want to let you all know and remind you that we didn't begin with a committee sitting down and planning a Committee for Racial Justice. We began with an incident on May 4th, 2011, an African-American member of the Santa Monica High School wrestling team was held against his will by two Caucasian teammates while there were chants of slaves for sale and a noose was hung nearby. This racially charged incident and the district's slow response were the catalyst for the formation of the Committee for Racial Justice. The committee consists of parents of students of Santa Monica High School, students, committee members, and religious leaders. Pre and post COVID, we hold monthly workshops at Virginia Avenue Park. That started 12 years ago. The Committee for Racial Justice has continued to focus on education in the school system, and we are actively also involved in other areas now as well. We're involved with the courts, with police, with the city, with faith communities, with food, housing, as systemic racism touches all aspects of life. Our mission statement reads, with a conviction that all human beings deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, we are committed to combating all forms of racial injustice, covert and overt, individualized and systemic, that still take place in our community. While racism affects many cultural groups, we are especially drawn to focus on the severe impact it has on the African American community. Tonight's topic is reparations and affirmative action. Where do we go from here? The recent US Supreme Court ruling against affirmative action raises many questions about the possible barriers to black students applying to colleges and possible connections to attempts to roll back or hamper efforts of some cities and states to address issues of reparations. We want to explore the ramifications of the new court ruling and strategies to combat any barriers that might be hampering movement toward equity. And we have with us tonight three amazing expert panelists. Kamala Moore, Dr. Catherine E. Jeffrey, and our third panelist is Dr. Jane Henry, and will be introduced more and momentarily. First, we have some updates. The first update is from Angela. Scott. Angela? Yep. <laughs> hey, good <laughs> evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, I am so looking forward to this uh, tonight's topic because it's near and dear to my heart. Um, a couple of updates coming out of the Public Safety Reform and Oversight Commission. We did have two reappointments, and that is for our chair, um, Derek Devermont as well as our another, another commissioner, um, that is Jaime Cruz. Unfortunately, we did lose the position of um, Commissioner Adia Mahanti because she has aged out of the young adult category. And so right now we are looking to fill that spot that is for ages 18 to 22. So if you know a young adult, who uh, you think would be a good fit to come in and discuss police reform. We are accepting applications right now for that role. Um, fortunately though, uh, Ms. Mohanty will continue with us because we did just begin a school safety subcommittee uh, which she is currently uh, co-chairing with myself. So. That is the updates we have right now for the Public Safety Reform and Oversight Commission. So again, if you know of a young adult, please reach out to either myself or someone on our steering committee here on CRJ, and they will forward that information to me, and we'll make sure that they have 
all the information they need as far as applying for that role. And that specifically is for the young adult ages 18 to 22. Um, so thank you for that. And I will hand back off to Janet. Thanks everyone for your patience as we are you know, in this hybrid space. So that means we are accommodating for those that are attending virtual like myself, in addition to those that are in person. So uh, Janet or Joanne, Robbie, take it away, or are you bouncing it back to me? <laughs> it, it, it's me. <laughs> um, Joanne Berlin, um, I'm also on the steering committee, and I wanted to give you an update uh, from the CRW Housing Committee. Um, they've been working on trying to get the uh, city council to be open to selling the civic center to uh, community court to be made into low-income housing and um, um, a, a community center and uh, kind of turning the land back to the community. And um, we've just gotten the bad news that uh, and some of you have signed the, the petition without that survey about that. Just gotten the bad news in recent weeks that um, the city council is no longer considering their proposal. So that's not going to happen. Don't know who they're going to sell it to or what they're going to do with that land, but um, we thought that specific that the uh, community court had a wonderful idea for uh, appropriate use of land that had been taken from the community. Anyway, um, so we're going to start with the uh, panel now and the introduction. And um, what you need to do, those of you on Zoom. You need to, uh, if you have questions or issues, um, write them in the chat. And Angela will be keeping track of those on Zoom in the chat. And then after all of our three speakers have spoken, then we have a QA and we will be doing, probably we'll be taking your questions live here in those, the last present year. So um, the first person is going to be. Um, wow. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Wow. <laughs> everybody on Zoom and everybody in person. Thank you, those who came in person so much. We appreciate it. <laughs> we appreciate it. That helps us to fill our space. You know, we have been meeting here for quite a long time. And so we want the park to still know that we still desire to, to be here. And um, tonight, I'm really excited because we have just some, I mean, we always have real good guests, right? <laughs> but tonight, we really have um, some, a, a challenging topic, but as well as, um, you know, people that, you know, I kind of look up to, and at least to two of the ladies who are here. I'm sorry, James, I'm just now going to meet you tonight. So I'm sure you'll be added to my list. Um, <laughs> so I just want to introduce to you tonight Pamela Moore, Chair of the California Reparations Task Force. Pamela is a, re a repair repairatory justice scholar and an attorney with a specialization in entertainment and intellectual property transactions. As a law student, Moore contributed to human rights reports related to domestic and international human rights issues, including, but not limited to, racial inequality in Brazil and the human rights san sanitation in Lowndes County, Alabama, USA, and the human rights, and the human right to remedy for indigenous Black women affected by racialized gender violence in Papua New Guinea. While studying abroad, abroad at the University of Amsterdam, Moore wrote a master thesis exploring the intersections between international law and preparatory justice for the transatlantic slave trade, chattel slavery, and their legacy. She earned a Juris Doctorate degree from Columbia Law School in New York City, a Master of Laws degree international criminal law from the University of Amsterdam and a bachelor's degree from the University of Los Angeles, UCLA. 
Pamela Moore was appointed, and this is really why we have her here tonight, uh, to the Reparations Task Force by Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon. And without further ado, what else can I say about this woman? Y'all need to Google it. Thank you so much for your service. Yeah, you good. Okay, thank you. There you go. Um, you can choose, um, if you know, play whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, in person and on the Zoom, my name is Camila Moore, and I'm the past chair of the California Reparations Task Force, as you all may or may not know. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom signed AB 3121 into law September 30th, 2020, which created the California Reparations Task Force. So me, alongside of eight other of my colleagues, served on this task force um, from June 2021 to July 1 of this year. And in those two years, uh, not only did we study, uh, the various different atrocities against the African American community, um, not only in the United States, but of course um, in the state of California from statehood to present. Uh, but we also developed comprehensive reparation proposals for the African American community um, that is forever memorialized in our 1100 page final report <laughs> that just uh, was released June 29th of this year. So I'm happy to, um, you know, be here with you all and be in conversation about um, the intersection between affirmative action and reparations and where do we go from here, which I think was coined by uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in his last book, Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here? So it's a very good title. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine E. Jeffrey, who will join uh, Kamala up here at, uh, on one of these chairs. Dr. Catherine E. Jeffrey has served as superintendent president of the Santa Monica College since February of 2016. Her experience in higher education spans four decades as a faculty member, counselor, and administrator. Dr. Jeffrey has also served as president of Sacramento City College, president of Hennepin Technical College in Minnesota, chief campus administrator provost of College of Southern Nevada. And she holds a PhD in educational administration from the University of Texas at Austin, an MS in applied behavioral studies and education, a BME in music. She is highly respected for her service on national and regional boards and committees. Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey spent her early years in Oklahoma City. And during the 60s, she developed a keen social justice perspective. I mean, welcome you to be with us, Dr. Catherine. Inviting me to be part of this discussion. I want to say that uh, my area of um, knowledge is most strong with respect to from the bash and not reparation. That's that's not my strong suit. I certainly have an opinion about reparation, but that's not going to be able to discuss with you tonight. Um, I have been at Santa Monica College for seven years, and during my time in higher education overall. I have uh, had the um, I was told earlier that this, this is a good group to, to, to share insight with. So I don't know who's on the participants list on the screen, <laughs> but I, I will say that this discussion about uh, affirmative action and issues related to race and race relationships in the United States um, is a long discussion um, that um, never seems to reach a serious critical point of resolution. And throughout my entire life, not just through my experience as an educator, 
I've been engaged in conversations that relate to race. And quite honestly, I wish we could talk about other things. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel that given the things that we know and the things that we see on a daily basis uh, across the United States, that we really should be at a different place in this whole conversation um, about race. And um, so I, I think you might have some specific questions to pose uh, to us, but I will just also say that I just recently returned from visiting with my family in Oklahoma. So I had a chance to go back and kind of fit into um, the community in which I was raised. And one of the reasons I'm in California is because I needed to leave that behind me. <laughs> I didn't want to leave my friends and my family. I enjoy going back to be with them. But there are a number of things about uh, that setting that I still find um, disquieting. Mm -hmm. And to be here now to, to talk about uh, some of the same topics and conversations that were part of the early years of my life uh -huh. when I was involved in the civil rights movement uh, is unsettling. Mm -hmm. And because I've only been back for a week, it's still a little raw for me. So I'm, I'm, if it seems as though I'm a little guarded in some of my remarks and comments, uh, I, I want to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and I want to keep myself respect. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, um, I will return the mic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Catherine Joe. All right, and now Angela is going to introduce our third guest. Yeah, thank you. I have, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Jeffrey. That is a lead in for sure. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. James Henry, who has been a colleague and mentor of mine for decades. Anyways, Dr. James Henry is a triple alumnus of California State University, Northridge. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in African-American studies. Uh, in 1991, he received an interdisciplinary master's degree in educational policy and leadership and master's degree in African-American studies in 1994. He completed his doctorate in higher education from Cal Lutheran University in 2014. Uh, Dr. Henry also holds a social science teaching credential and has been an educational opportunities program uh, academic advisor for the past 25 years. He is vice president of the Black Alumni Association and serves as the advisor to the Black Student Union at CSUN. He also teaches various Africana studies courses in addition to CSUN, Los Angeles Mission College, Los Angeles Valley College, and Ventura College. He, um, he has several publications that he's also um, been involved with, uh, those including the impact of utilizing a strength intervention to improve self-efficacy in low-income first-generation students, and that was in 2016. He also released uh, the Education of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which was his master thesis, in addition to a chapter on the importance of values in Black voices. Um, so here I am presenting Dr. James L. Henry, who has uh, presented also research on low-income first-generation students, as well as a resident, uh, former resident, grew up in Compton, he has a story to tell. He, uh, go ahead, James. I can't say enough about it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Again, I'm Dr. James Henry, and uh, I want my reparations. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be first in line. My uh, uh, mother and my, my mother's parents came from in 1955, and my grandfather and uh, uncles were able to get a job at Bethlehem Steel. 
Uh, I am the product of several uh, programs, including Live Action, and they work, and that's why there's such an attack against them. Uh, I grew up on 87th Street uh, between Central and Hooper. Uh, I was 16, 17, 18 during the Reagan oppressive crack and gang era of South Central. Uh, I was, thank God for my fifth grade teacher, the educator who saw in me and had a class and had me tested in the fifth grade. I don't know why she pulled me out, but thank God she did. They separated us in what was called academically enriched. I was in the first program that they called Magnet at Drew Junior High School. They separated us again from the community and we had all courses for three years together with the same cohort, all right? I, I was supposed to go to Fremont High School my brother got kicked out of Fremont. Two cousins got kicked out. My mother said, let's try something different. So there was a program called a permit with transportation. So I was bused to Monroe High School in the San Fernando Valley. So busing is wonderful. And I think it's only mandatory now in Sacramento. Why is that? Because it worked. And EOP, which is the, I work for the Educational Opportunity Program a government program which came out of the struggles in the 60s. It wasn't just giving it to us. It's a low-income, first-generation admissions program. So a council of state through Monroe High School summons me out of my class. I don't know why. <laughs> she said, uh, you know, fill out this application in college. I was like, I'm getting a football scholarship. <laughs> she said, well, what if you don't? And I had never, at the age of 18, thought, at 155 pounds, I wasn't going to get a football scholarship and go to the NFL. Imagine that. So I said, well, if, okay. if I feel like I'm going to college, I don't have any money. Thank God for the affirmative action, Dr. Henry, Central Los Angeles. <laughs> okay. okay. We have you froze for a minute, but I think you're back. Um, so that was a um, a preview introduction of all of our panelists. Um, let's dive in. Is this the reasonable mic? Is it okay. Are we gonna have to have the people come up here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For a change, guess what? We have full time for QA. So please tell me. Now, I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. Okay. So we're going to do what we usually do. What we usually do is count off to five. We do it in five. I'm sorry, John. What? Oh, you got a question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got plenty of time. Okay. So one, two, three. Okay. Let's just go with three for right now. Come on, guys. You know, it's it's so refreshing to hear some history. Because when we look at history, we have to respect much of the sacrifice that brought us here. And the brother talked about. EOP. In reference to EOP, let me first recite something that came from Barack Obama at the 2004 convention. And he was concerned about, even though there were red states and blue states, there was hostility toward people of color and people who were marginalized and not being taken in the mainstream by government in those red states. He ended the saying that says, it's not a question when it comes to our people, it's not a question of blue states and red states, but United States. I say that to say essentially, when we look at EOP, there was a forerunner to it and the Black Student Alliance had a series of tutorial programs as a result of the Watch Up Right. The reason why I bring that up is 
a lot of young students got educated. And so when I look at specifically talks about the South and Florida, I find it uh, strange and upsetting that a child in Florida doesn't know about Greenville. A child in Oklahoma City or in the Oklahoma School District doesn't know about the cultural race riots. Even if they do, you know, it's not being addressed somewhere out of the home. A child in Texas. I'm, I'm coming. I know you're coming, but you know, we got to take it. A child in Texas can't learn about Juneteenth and Juneteenth is a national holiday. The question becomes, what is it in the way of structure that can be outlined to where we have a core curriculum if indeed those red states don't necessarily ascribe to African-American history, more or less choosing to highlight critical race theory and, and, and say, well, that's the sense of the white people. What is it that we can do to more or less address curriculum that's sensitive that shows the show true uh, depiction of what happened here in America? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's a question. Well, I mean, since there are educators in the room, oh. I, I, would, I would submit that to the educators. Okay. So, Dr. Jeffries, did you want to? Okay. She said, I knew it. The question is not related to the topic for the evening. I'll just sound at that in terms of affirmative action and reparations. But it is related to how we learn and how we, how we um, start with our young people to help them understand the world around them. How to improve um, the way this is done across systems in the country? If we have the answer to that, we can do it better. Let's start by saying that um, the opportunities are plenty to make a difference. Uh, in some states, we're not going in the right direction; we're going against the direction that we should be. Uh, and the reference that was made by the um, the person who, prayed, who uh, posed the question, Craig, uh, the issue of textbooks, what's in the textbooks. Um, I already said I'm from Oklahoma. We did not learn about the incident in Tulsa. And when I went to Tulsa and uh, spent time with my family members there, this um, uh, the rate riot uh, was never mentioned. I learned about that as an adult. So you're absolutely right. There are things that are omitted. Uh, is that the way it should be? Absolutely not. But there are a lot of things that shouldn't be in terms of how we engage with each other in this society. The way to start might be to be honest, some levels of honesty, some levels of uh, acknowledgement, that our history is not uh, filled with uh, things that are always positive. We have to help people understand the reality of the world we live in. Being truthful about what has happened in the past is one way to get us to a place where we can better understand and deal with where we are in the present. That's what I would say, not just as an educator, but as a person. That's what makes sense to me. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just share um, some of the um, work that the task force has done on this, and I just want to kind of give a nod to you in terms of uh, what you just said. Um, it just reminded me of like the 10-point plan of the Black Panther Party, one of which was we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true, our true history and our role in present day society. We believe in an educational system that will give to our people a knowledge of self. If man does not have knowledge of himself and his position in society and the world, then he has little chance to relate to anything else. So and that was written by Bobby Seal, who was uh, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. Um, in terms of what the California Restorations Task Force has done or what we've recommended, um, you can look at um, chapter 33 in our final report 
we're actually recommending that the California State Legislature uh, continue the development of a curriculum that we've been working with uh, professors out of UC Berkeley to develop, to implement into um, primarily for right now, grades nine through 12. Um, and so yeah, we um, actually consulted with Dr. Travis J. Bristol and Dr. Talona A. Britton from UC Berkeley. And they've been working with us for the past few months and to develop a curriculum that hopefully we can implement into grades um, nine through 12, but hopefully through K through 12 eventually um, through legislative action. Um, also the task force is recommending uh, the legislature create a public education fund uh, specifically dedicated to educating the public about African-American history in the United States and California, um, modeling off of, for instance, a public education fund found in the Japanese American Incarceration and Operations Commission recommendation um, back in the 1980s. So um, that's just some of the recommendations coming out of the task force on that, that um, question. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Angela. <laughs> Uh, five quick points I want to make, uh, and you know, they may be popular and they may not, but I'm just going to say them anyway. Uh, one, we need our own black schools. If, if, if at all possible in whatever community you are, if you can send your black children to a black school with black teachers and black administrators, oh, that our children come out usually uh, better suited education wise in that situation. That's not going to happen here in California. We used to have Marcus Garvey, which was doing wonderful things. We had Oma Wale in Pasadena, but we just don't have a concentrated enough community to keep those going. Uh, that being said, uh, we have to sue these states. You know, I, I wish I would have went to uh, law school instead of becoming, you know, an adjunct professor or an advisor, because when, when people make unjust laws like Thoreau said and King after him, you know, you got to fight those unjust laws. Uh, you know, right after Brown versus the Board of Education, as soon as we had integration, they immediately started uh, trying to, you know, counter the effects, positive effects of integration. Uh, and then finally, social media, you know, this is a wonderful time for our young students to be able to get an education yourself. It's it's there, you know what I mean? Stop looking at the craziness, but we have to encourage them to also use social media uh, to gain knowledge. And uh, the one of the wonderful things that has happened is ethnic studies being uh, now mandatory in LAUSD. So that's really gonna change the whole dynamic of the students that we are producing that are gonna come out of that uh, institution uh, because I mean, I didn't get introduced to ethnic studies till I was in college, but if I had, you know, been introduced, you know, from elementary school, you know, oh my God, my journey would be totally different. I'd like to add a couple of things. I, I really um, like this opportunity to kind of uh, bounce back and forth between the three of us. <laughs> I, I had said earlier that reparations wasn't my uh, area of expertise. Mm -hmm. However, I did go online. I started reading the report. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a good report. Mm -hmm. I like what's in it. But I went online to also better understand the word reparations. What is it intended to mean? Mm -hmm. you know, I started with a very basic definition. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I did was look at what would reparations do for us, mm -hmm. for any group? Mm -hmm. And the following forms of reparation were identified online. Restitution. Yeah. You know, we usually think of restitution in terms of compensation. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And guarantees of non-repetition. And that guarantee of non-repetition mm -hmm. is really, I think, a key mm -hmm. because to be compensated, to have what feels like some modicum of uh, satisfaction through the compensation, mm -hmm. what does that do to guarantee non-repetition? 
And that is what I think really uh, fits into the question about the educational system, uh, the laws, mm -hmm. the ways we interact with each other and treat each other, because if the repetition occurs, yeah. what happens? Is there more reparation? And then we get additional checks and compensation, <laughs> you know. And so where is it a cycle? Mm. So I think there are a lot of questions to to be asked in terms of what is adequate in terms of reparation, and how how does real difference occur in the broader society, so that the need for um, consideration of reparation isn't isn't where we are spending our time and our resources. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. Um, this question, um, I suppose it's for everyone, but I imagine there's what we'll have the most to say about it. Um, I am here wearing two hats. I'm with the city, but I'm also on the fund for operations now. And we um, just had our board meeting um, this morning. We were talking about how excited we were to like launch um, you know, a campaign to support uh, the findings of the task force, is my understanding, yeah. and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the goal now is to get the legislature in the coming mm -hmm. session to adopt the recommendation. So we're wondering how can we like most effectively start organizing um, in alignment with the task force and like what resources are available to, to make this happen? Okay, great. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you. And yes, yeah, great question. And thank you for the support. Uh, one, we're encouraging folks to go to uh, supportreparations.org if you haven't already. That's where individuals can sign on in support of the task force and our final report. Um, if you belong to an organization, you can sign on in support of our final report and the task force's findings as well. But to your point, now that the task force is over, this is where the real work begins. Um, the California state legislators, they're coming off of summer recess very soon, but the earliest that they can actually introduce legislation is November, December, of, of this year, um, January of 2024. So uh, between now and then, um, you know, it's important to, you know, educate folks about the task force and their findings. I would say a concrete recommendation is to link with CJEC. It's an organization called a Coalition for a Just and Equitable California. Uh, they were one of the seven anchor organizations that were working alongside the task force for the past two years. Um, educating folks about what was going on. And um, now that the task force is over, they're continuing to do the work. Um, and so we're definitely going to need allies in this movement and in this next six to eight months. So I would definitely say, uh, and we can lead afterwards, I can give you um, the, the lead organizer, Chris Lawson's direct contact um, to, yeah, just be in communication over the next six to eight months around um, organizing an effective campaign to make sure that our final recommendations just don't collect us um, and are actually turned into comprehensive um, legislation that will be passed by the state legislature and then signed into law by the government. So thank you. Yeah, you know, guys, remember a few months ago, those of you who were here, when we had uh, two other members of the task force here, uh, Dr. Cheryl Groves and Don Tam Tamaki, and they told us mm -hmm. it's going to take everybody working on this and to push it in. And actually, Don described it as a, a ground slow. Mm -hmm. So we already know that at CRJ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we know what, what needs to happen. So we definitely yeah. are, are, you know, going to gear up. Okay, Joy. I'm on camera. Okay. <laughs> Like, I got to get you the money. Yeah, I got to get you the money. This has got to be fast. Yeah, I had um, a couple questions um, because when we thought about putting this workshop together, 
we were responding, of course, to the Supreme Court's recent uh, handing down of further damaging what had been affirmative action. And um, I thought at the time, how is this going to impact cities and states uh, that have been working on reparations? Because I see a connection myself between reparations and affirmative action. And so uh, I'm just wondering whether the panelists see that this is going to put a damper on this move to our reparations because when California as a state decided that you could no longer use race to um, uh, decide who gets to get into a college, um, the black and brown student population just plummeted across the whole state. I heard the other day that Stanford University has only two percent black students. Um, so uh, I uh, I'm wondering about that from the panelists, and I'm also wondering uh, about whether the reparations commission. I guess they're not meeting anymore because we've done the pieces, we've done the thing. So those uh, the two of you who are more involved with colleges, um, what is the workaround to try to make sure? That um, and brown students can still be um, admitted to college at a um, reasonable uh, percentage in relationship to what they're at least as a percentage of what they are in the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. what are this uh, Supreme Court ruling to be a real problem that is going to um, make it harder for students to get higher education who aren't Caucasian? Okay, that was the battle that was worse. Everybody go jump, James. Yeah, I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, uh, so there's a there's a senator. I'm not sure what state he's from in the United States Senate. His name is uh, uh White House, and he put forth legislation uh for um the dark money that has been given uh to the you know false amicus briefs and you know same thing with abortion the federalist society basically is funding these groups to bring forth these false cases so he wanted he put forth legislations that they had to disclose where this money was coming from and who was funding these cases so you know that because of the makeup of the Senate, that's probably not going to pass. But, you know, we need our own Democratic, not assuming that everybody's a Democrat, but we we need our own oligarchs to put forth their monies behind these cases in the same way it was done with affirmative, ac affirmative action in the same way it was done with uh, abortion. So, and uh, the other question uh, you know, uh, EOP has been an affirmative action program for 50 years, you know, so when Arnold Schwarzenegger tried to just cancel the program, all of the alumni, you know, called the California Senate and they was like, no, you cannot get rid of EOP. So we already have a workaround because the using race was really only for law schools and medical schools. So these programs are for low income and first generation students. Now, it just so happened because of our socioeconomic status that that usually is black and brown students. But, you know, so there's still ways to admit, uh, you know, underrepresented students to college. But we still are going to have on those committees you know, people that even read the letter of the struggles you had in South Central and say no. So it is, it's definitely a problem. I would add that for the EOP criteria, it is not uh, it, from the beginning or nor now uh, a focus on race. It focuses on several different criteria. And in the essays that were sent <laughs> colleges that had race as a factor, the Supreme Court decision focused on race in the way it was singled out or, or in the way it stood out. So not race alone, 
as the factor. But when you look at the person's lived experience in terms of like, ways to consider what has happened in a person's life, as they describe the circumstances of their, their lived experience, um, as um, Professor uh, James said, you talk about first in college, in the family, the community in which the person lives, what their exposures have been, race combined with all of those things, uh, including the income of the family, are ways to add additional elements of consideration for the reader. I think it's important also to underscore that the reader of those essays needs to understand what's being described in the essays. If the reader doesn't understand what they're reading, then the only thing they really focus on is the piece that deals with race. And that's part of the problem, uh, and probably why uh, the Supreme Court made the ruling that it did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so just a little bit around like the intersection between affirmative action and reparations as it relates to the task force's work. So one of the issues that the task force had to resolve over the course of the past two years was who would be eligible for reparations in the state of California? Um, would it be all black people, regardless of national origin, for instance, um, so a race-based standard on its face, or would it only be for those who are descendants of American slaves, um, you know, African Americans, uh, those who could trace their lineage uh, back to someone who was enslaved in this country? Um, and so the task force had this ongoing debate for over 10 months. It was very a difficult conversation, very sensitive conversation to have in the public. Uh, we consulted expert genealogists, um, other folks. We also consulted UC Berkeley Law School Dean Erwin Shemarinsky, who is one of the foremost constitutional law scholars in the country to advise us on um, you know, the idea of who should be eligible. And that was in February of 2021. So last year, right? Um, well, February of 2022, excuse me. And so um, last year, he essentially predicted the outcome of, of the affirmative action case before the Supreme Court um, on June 29th, over a year, you know, before it happened. And he essentially stated that, you know, the Supreme Court has become increasingly more conservative. And so it's more, more than likely that they were going to strike down um, race conscious um, admission standards for higher education. And he was right. Um, and in his recommendation, he essentially recommended the task force adopt a lineage based standard rather than a race based standard for one. Um, because race-based preferences um, were already illegal in California um, via Proposition 209, but also because of this, what he called an impending decision coming up in the following year where he was sure that the Supreme Court would be striking down race conscious damage. And again, he was right. So um, <clears throat> I say all that to say, most of the recommendations in the final report of the task force um, remain unaffected by the Supreme Court's decision striking down race conscious admissions because we adopted a lineage based standard. So most of our recommendations are designed or nearly tailored, to use constitutional language, uh, nearly tailored uh, towards descendants of slaves. Um, the other point that I wanted to raise in terms of the intersection between affirmative action and reparations. Um, I think a lot of people misunderstand what the Supreme Court actually decided um, um, in this affirmative action decision. So the Supreme Court said that you cannot have race conscious preferences on the basis of, of a justification of diversity. So diversity is not a compelling enough interest to discriminate against people on the basis of race. However, the Supreme Court said that affirmative action still is okay or permissible under a remedial exception. So if, let's say, Harvard 
or University of North Carolina. Those were the two institutions um, that were defending their race conscious admissions program, but they were defending it on the basis of a diversity rationale. Um, and I just want to just quickly, can I just, just bring this home? I want to um, recommend an article to you all that came out June of this year. Um, it was written by um, a white law professor, Evan Mandery, called How White People Stole Affirmative Action and Ensured Its Demise. So essentially, what uh, Professor Mandery was arguing is that if Harvard and the University of North Carolina defended its affirmative action policies on the basis of a remedial exception, if they admitted the past atrocities that their particular institutions were responsible for as it relates to African-American students or any particular group of students in its, in its school history, then more than likely, ironically enough, the Supreme Court actually would have upheld its affirmative action um, programs. It was because they based their affirmative action um, programs and justified it on a diversity rationale the Supreme Court said that concept is too vague, it's too amorphous to uh, withstand constitutional scrutiny. And so um, I just wanted to just read this really quick clip um, from the article that pretty much corroborates what I just said, um, where it says, <sighs> Okay, Boston University School of Law professor Jonathan Feingold, who has written extensively about affirmative action, wasn't surprised about the ruling, telling me the remedial justification has a stronger constitutional mooring than the diversity rationale. Yet neither Harvard nor North Carolina asserted a remedial justification for their respective affirmative action programs. When Justice Pataki Brown Jackson questioned University of North Carolina's attorney, Brian Y. Park about the relevance of UNC's history of racial exclusion, Park replied, we're not pursuing any sort of remedial justification for our policy. David Hinojosa, representing the group of students who intervened in the UNC case, similarly told Sotomayor, we are not suggesting, as I understand, the university is not either, that the limited consideration of race in this case is being used as a remedial order. So um, essentially, um, I wanted to read another part. Uh, so yeah, essentially, what they're what this article um, is saying is that institutions, educational institutions, they're not at the point yet that they're ready to admit their own history of exclusion, of racial exclusion in their institutions. And if they were ready and willing to admit their history, then affirmative action on the basis of remediation, actually it's still permissible, it's still good law. But because they based it on a diversity rationale, again, the Supreme Court said that's too amorphous, too vague of a concept to justify um, discriminating people uh, against people on the basis of race. So, um, you know, affirmative action on the basis of it being on a diversity rationale is dead, which makes reparations even more necessary. That's the only option really available um, for, um, you know, these, um, you know, um, disparities to, to, to close. Reparations literally is our only option. And ironically enough, you have the Supreme Court saying that's still good law. Structuring law on the basis of re remediation is still good law. And so it's up to people like us to start getting organized um, and start championing um, reparations as well. I would add to that <laughs> that the uh, with respect to affirmative action, um, researchers say that none of the uh, uh, alternatives that have been effective, uh, none of the alternatives that are being used that schools were racist, not the single factor, mm -hmm. uh, none of those alternatives has been as effective as considering race. Race is something people understand more directly. Mm -hmm. Nothing is as good at helping, and this is in quotes, 
Nothing is as good is as good at helping to enroll a more racially equitable class than using race. Nothing comes close to it. There are other tools and other ideas, but if race is not taken into consideration, those different types of techniques and tools do not replicate what race conscious admissions policies do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so we have like nine questions on the oh Angela, okay, definitely you. And then you want to go ahead with the ones on the chat. Yeah. Right oh now. yeah, those are the ones on the chat were uh, mainly just um links. But I did have a question. Thank you, Robbie. I did have a question uh, for uh, Ms. Camilla and then everyone else. So as we look at transformative change, right, with especially um, in consideration of equity within education, right? Um, I think Dr. Henry brought up a good point as far as our Black schools in HBCUs. So I'm wondering if any recommendation that came out of the task force even kind of alluded to that also being a possibility as far as reparation and funding, like additional quote unquote special programs? Like, I guess I have a two part question. Number one, um, was there any mention of potentially and some near future uh, creating an HBCU within California? And then my second question, again, really dives into what does subsidies look like for folks who are looking to have additional assistance with sending their kids, even from pre-K to pre-K to 14, I'll say pre-K to, um, to junior college and college level, especially when we know that oftentimes, you know, the schools are limited with the education products that they have in that school, right? So are we looking at potentially um, supplementing that with more permits to uh, go to um, like a private school if they wish, or go to a school school outside of their district or, or a school within their district that's in a more affluent area? Like what are the subsidies? How, what are they doing as far as really addressing that uh, disparity within education? from a repar reparation standpoint, is that like one of the big key factors is the funding that potentially will go into uh, the equity and education piece? Yes, so uh, just to take a step back in terms of how the final report is structured. Uh, so the task force found that after obviously 255 years, of course, labor, um, there were lingering and still are lingering bad incidents in the land, um, that still permeate the society and still uh, predominantly and disproportionately negatively impact African Americans, those who are descendants of slaves. And so after our chapter on enslavement are 12 chapters, and those 12 chapters each identify what the task force is calling a badge, an incident of slavery. And one of the 12 badges and incidents of slavery we identify is separate and unequal education. So in each of those chapters where we describe those badges and incidents of slavery, there's a section that details California's history, right? Um, concrete examples of, of exclusionary public policy um, 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 sanctioned on behalf of the state of California. And then there's a federal section that details the United States world. Um, so for instance, in California, we found, right? California is the fifth most segregated uh, state when it comes to schooling. Um, and so we have um, many different recommendations, uh, reparation recommendations in the areas of education. Um, one of them being free college tuition to state colleges and universities uh, for descendants of slaves. The other was the creation of a K through 12 uh, curriculum that I mentioned earlier. Um, but in terms of, you know, um, those funding um, disparities that you were mentioning, um, one of the recommendations is, you know, generally speaking, but there's more detail in the report um, in this chapter 23, um, increase funding to schools to address racial disparities, fund grants to local educational agencies to address the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on pre-existing racial disparities in education. Uh, we have 
um, employing proven strategies to recruit African American teachers uh, to the point that the panelists made earlier, um, advancing the timeline for ethnic studies classes, adopting a freedom school summer program, reducing racial disparities in the STEM fields for African American students. Um, expanding access to career technical education, improving access to public schools. And then also um, one of the recommendations is to, to create a new state agency tentatively called the California American Freedmen Affairs Agency to pay homage to the Freedmen's Bureau that once existed in this country and was supposed to help transition newly freed slaves from pure segregation to freedom. And a lot of people don't know the Freedmen's Bureau, they also created Freedmen's Schools, and some of those schools still exist today as HBCUs, like Howard University and Hampton. Those are premier HBCUs that started off as Freedmen's Schools. So one of the recommendations is for this agency to have an education branch and to create, I guess you could consider them to be Black schools HBCUs in the state of California. So that's also one of the recommendations as well. <laughs> Long, long answer, but I got it there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, finally. <laughs> okay, Angela, more questions? Um, okay, so let me see. I didn't see anything uh, in the chat and I'm asking folks or they can raise their hand, but I think that was like a, a deeper dive. I mean, you did exactly... You mentioned exactly what I was thinking of, because I know, like, say I'm a veteran and I know from a veteran standpoint, you know, depending upon the type of quote unquote benefits that we receive, our children have benefits in college, which you mentioned, you know, with respect to free state college tuition and even supplementing. So, again, like you said, I, I think everybody needs to then understand. And here's my question. Looking at your timeline the recommendations have occurred. Now you say they go into session, right? Can you kind of um, show that timeline again of what we need to do to help support what you're doing? Yes, so the California state legislators, they are coming back from summer recess very soon. Um, so um, between now and let's say October, November is what uh, community organizers are called the bill writing phase. So it's very internal where um, you know organizers are going to be um, having meetings with legislators to make sure whatever these legislators um, write in terms of the legislation um, put forth with the final recommendations. There's no like extra stuff that is staying true to the integrity of the final recommendation. Um, so that's going to be happening between now and, you know, November is that bill writing phase, but the earliest that these legislators can actually introduce legislation is November, December of this year, or more than likely January of next year. So January of 2024 is when you're going to see state legislators, most likely is going to be led by the Congressional Legislative Black Caucus and some other allies as well, um, introducing uh, reparations legislation based on that final report. And so from January, 2024 to let's say June, July, this time around next year is going to be the, you know, the debating um, on the assembly and the Senate floor in terms of whatever is being introduced by those legislators. Um, and then we can see the governor signing some of the first, you know, uh, reparations legislation into law, um, you know, September, um, October of next year. So it's a very fast timeline. So between now um, and next year, you'll have the bill writing, the bill introducing, and the bill passing phases. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. I'm so sorry. I have one more question. Just one more. This is a really good one. I have a question. No. Can I just? Um, and this is just. Angela, Angela, let me just ask this real quick. Um, I don't know if anybody of our panelists know this or not, but this is coming upon a one year anniversary that we have uh, Committee for Racial Justice has with the community. Uh, requested an apology and received it uh, from the city of Santa Monica, but we also had a list of actions 
Yeah. And one of those list of actions, you know, you know, because the city is saying they don't have any money right now, but we're saying low-hanging fruit, things that we know that they can do. Um, and I guess this is kind of for both of you, but definitely for Ms. Ms. Jeffrey, um, Dr. Jeffrey. Um, we have proposed that they give free tuition to San Marco College. Now we know there's a certain group of students that receive that, but we don't know if it, you know, am I getting it right, Angela? All the African American students, right? For all of them, so it's not just yeah. the ones yes. that are like entering entering that college age, but this is like for all adults that right. want to suddenly yeah. turn around and go to college. What are the opportunities? I'd like to respond to that question as well. Okay, well, I'd like to let Ms. Jeffrey go first. Yeah, no, go, go ahead, no problem. <laughs> well, that hasn't been presented. Okay, so she, 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 they, well, so obviously they have not, the city has not done anything regarding that, and it's about to be one year. The recommendation has not come to, uh, to Santa Monica College, okay. but the issue of uh, free tuition, Angela spoke to it in terms of programs that already exist, like our Promise Program, uh, does offer um, free uh, admission for students who are in their first year, so that already exists, and that's not just for um, students who are local here in my district it's for any students uh, in the state of California. So that is in place and has been in place at SMC uh, the whole time that I've been there for the past seven years. Uh, in terms of whether or not every student who's African American would potentially qualify if this is something that the city brings forward, I, I can't say that that's something that would be granted. Uh, what I can say is I think it's uh, that question along with the question uh, related to other marginalized populations of students, which includes Latinx students as well, uh, would be important to take a look at. Also, our students who are uh, Asian Pacific Islander, who come from various communities, where they are marginalized as well. It's, it is a, a bigger group when it comes to individuals in our community, uh, in our country, and certainly in our state, who are marginalized. It's, it's a bigger issue. And you can't take care of one and not take care of the others too. I think it has to be looked at. Now, who comes first? You know, nobody wants to be first in that line. <laughs> we don't want to be. <laughs> but, but we know what we're talking about here today. And we also know that um, there are a number of things that I believe communities are trying to do. I want to just share that last year I was um, nominated in Oklahoma City for um, an award because of my uh, education that I received in public school. But to um, the professors um, from Northridge, to your comment about uh, have our own schools, and I think Angela, you mentioned it as well. I grew up in a segregated community, so we did have our own schools. Mm -hmm. And the teachers who poured their, their energy into me were teachers who were Black. They were from the community. They were African-American. Now, is that the way you, you envision this being set up? I, I don't think that's what you're describing, but the end result was the same. I had teachers who cared enough about me at every stage from K through 12. And not only... Um, did they look like me? They lived in the community. Well, these days we all live in different communities. We we don't we live in communities all that are spread far and wide. So that identification 
with the parents, with the families, is, is not what we have anymore. It is what I grew up with. But I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the city, Oklahoma City, did uh, recognize what I've been able to accomplish in my lifetime as a result of what I experienced in public schools. And the public schools there at the time I was growing up were outstanding, not just because they were public schools, but because of the teachers who were in those public schools who cared enough about me because they were me. I was a reflection of them. And that makes a difference. Oh. Yes, it does. And I'll just say, we did have a school here that was particularly for African-American and others, any non-white students, Garfield Elementary School, or just Garfield School, right, John? And that school was the first principal of that school was Dr. Al Alvin Quinn, who was Al Alvin Quinn, who was Alvin Quinn. Okay. okay, Dr. Quinn, who I adored, who when I went uh, to San Monte College, he was everybody's mentor, everybody's mentor, but particularly uh, you could see him rushing around campus with his dashiki on uh, because, you know, he was our guy. So I really appreciated that. So the school, it was a little different here. Uh, Garfield was even though Dr. Quinn was there, but there were a lot of things that were that, that happened at that school that were actually not beneficial. Uh, but what it did do was build a bond between the students that went together, and they do meet still. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I think I'll come back to you, Kamala, because I want to talk about how CRJ, I know we have to you know, we're going to sign the petition or whatever we're going to do. We want to get involved, but okay. But we want to um, talk about, you know, how we can better help. Um, James, did you want to speak to that? Uh, uh, the, the yeah, prior. yeah, yeah. I can save it for later. I just had some ideas about uh, the re the money for the reparations because, and I, I, I don't think Santa Monica can honestly say they ain't got no money. <laughs> well, we don't think that either. And in regards to other groups, we are not insensitive to other groups as well. We actually told them in a board in the meeting, hey, whatever you have to do for you know all the other groups, you need to do that too. But we are here. We are here right now to the sundown town, to the previous sundown town. Mm. I'm just saying mm -hmm. they I didn't write. I didn't write it. I didn't make the laws. I didn't make it happen. They did that. But we're here. So you have some, did you have something, Angela? I see we have another question in the chat too. Yeah. Well, I don't see anything. That was something else that came through the chat. Yeah. I just had, yeah. I just had a real quick question. And this is really for um Dr. Henry and Dr. Jeffrey. Um, and then um uh, Ms. Kamala at the end. But uh, Ms. Kamala mentioned that they are looking at one of the su suggestions was, to your point, Dr. Henry, hiring Black educators. So I'm wondering from your position, as well as um, uh, Dr. Jeffrey, what do you see as number one, the problem, and then number two, the solution? What are your thoughts on how we could increase um, the hiring of black and brown teachers because I know that's you know that is an issue right now as far as getting them hired and that's throughout that's not just that's all school districts and colleges and everything in sure. California yeah yeah I'm, I mentioned earlier about what we call unjust laws you know one thing's about the real critical race theory it talks about how the law is actually used to enforce racism. So people don't like to talk about critical race theory, but I like to because that's exactly what's happening. That's what happened with abortion. That's what happened with affirmative action, losing, using the law to enforce racism. So uh, if you if you read Thurgood Marshall, not just his response in Baki for affirmative action case, but he wanted quotas. If, if you don't count the discrimination then how do you know? You know, initially when they went after affirmative action in the 70s, they said, well, you just have to make an affirmative action. 
you just have to reach out and, and ask people to apply. <laughs> so if you get 100 people that apply and one get hired, <laughs> it, was that an affirmative action? So I, I like quotas, even though it's illegal, but it's only illegal because the Supreme Court said it was, and they could surely say that it is not. I mean, how do you ever know if somebody is discriminating if you don't count, you know? So uh, they always talk about merit. I mean, come on, you know, we got the leader of Florida, we got the 44 and they talking about merit, are you kidding me? So we know it's more to it than, you know, that concept. So I think we could definitely hire, uh, uh, you know, graduates from HBUs. And again, affirmative action was, it is successful. So. So they're out there. It's just a matter of uh, counting and somebody saying, you know, what's the accountability? All right. Uh, Cal State Northridge, for example, you know, you guys have 5% African-American faculty. Uh, next year, can you have 5.1? <laughs> you know what I mean? So somebody needs to say, is there being an affirmative action in your outreach to uh, instructors of color? Okay. And Santa Monica College, I can honestly say that our search process, uh, I can speak from the time that I've been there, over the last seven years, has resulted in very diverse pools of candidates coming forward in most content areas. Uh, not for all, but for the majority of them. I have seen very diverse pools of candidates. In some cases, all of the candidates have been individuals who might uh, be identified as coming from marginalized uh, populations. So I have seen positive results from our search committees for faculty positions and for classified positions. And I can say with certainty for faculty positions because I interviewed every single finalist for faculty positions. So I see them, I know who's coming through and getting out of the committees. I also have seen some cases where the committees have not forwarded candidates. And I do look back and question uh, the process and try to find out what happened uh, so that no candidates moved forward. Uh, in terms of the numbers of individuals who move forward, we're looking for the best qualified teacher. Now, I know that can be loaded language when you talk about who's most qualified, but I just said, our pools are diverse so that when the finalists get to me, there is diversity. I am not choosing just the individual who represents diversity in the pool. I'm looking for the individual who is going to be the best teacher to stand in front of our students because that's what our students deserve at Santa Monica College. But I am very confident also that the individuals who have been selected, regardless of their race and ethnicity, but especially for those who are Black, who are Brown, who are uh, Asian uh, descendants, um, and Native American uh, descendants as well. We have an excellent pool of uh, faculty, new faculty who have been hired over the last seven years who are in front of our students. So regardless of who's standing in front of our students, if they were hired in the last seven years, our students, have the benefit of the very best candidates that came forward. I feel strongly about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> what about you, Angela? Any questions? Any more questions? No, I didn't know if, uh, uh, Ms. Foster, I didn't know if you were going to comment on that at all um, based on anything else from that recommendation, Ms. Willa. I didn't know if you were to comment, or that was it. No, she said no. Okay. Okay. So I do, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Robbie. One more question. You mentioned the California Freedmen Affairs. How do we get involved in that if we're interested? Um, or that. Say your question again, Angela. Uh, Ms. Camilla had mentioned the California Freedmen Affairs as one of the potential programs regarding, um, and I do have a question in here, regarding that would be the the funding, uh, but specifically it was based out of the Freedmen Schools, right? But you mentioned there's actually a group now, the Freedmen Affairs Committee, I guess, or subcommittee. So I was wondering if there was a way that we can get involved, because I know Dr. Henry probably be trying. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
<laughs> and then no. there's one more question. Go ahead. So the creation of a new state agency, that was one of a hundred recommendations that the task force gave to the state legislature. So there isn't any committee um, on that, but one of the recommendations, again, the task force made was legislature, you all need to pass legislation that would create a new state agency, and that agency would provide ongoing direct preparatory justice services to dependents and slaves. Um, in the state of California um, to improve um, our life outcomes across different areas from health to business to education to wealth building. Um, but it would also, um, how would you say, also would um, provide oversight over existing state agencies to ensure that you know, our 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment rights are not being abridged. Um, and so uh, in terms of personally, what I'm I'm hoping our priority legislation, um, some of the, the first bills that the state legislatures, um, state legislature actually turns into legislation is legislation that would create a new state agency, um, legislation that would be for um, cash payments uh, for descendants of slaves, um, you know, free tuition um, to state colleges and universities. Those are some of like the things that I would hope. Um, our priority legislation um, in the next year. Um, yep. Hold on to that. There's another question, Angela, you said? Yes, um, Hazard had a question. Hazard, did you want to ask your question or did you want me to? You want to come off speaker? You're off speaker. I mean, you're- Okay, I mean, I can go ahead and ask. So she said, when other groups are fighting to right the wrongs that have come to them, why do that, why, why uh, to them they do not include so-called black people in their fight and she said why are we afraid to just say descendants of enslaved americans and freedmen so i guess you know this goes back to all of the different languages that we're using now um you know people of color bipoc people african-american black people so i guess this is where that question is really sitting as far as you know um how are we terming ourselves, Hajar? Is that correct? Not really, not really that. It's more so like I noticed that when we when we start talking about the things that we need for the so-called black community, we always have to include others, but other people don't include others. And I, I guess we feel like that because it feels like we're not looking out for everyone, which is totally not the case because everyone has gotten something. Um, and so I'm just wondering why it is that we can never feel comfortable just saying, you know, whatever it is that you call yourself, Black, African American, American Indian, you know, a lot of us have been mislabeled other things. But, but, but why to, can't we? I'm sorry, to the task force credit, they, they were very clear that these reparations were to be for the descendants of enslaved African Americans. The Native Americans got billions of dollars, even though we certainly don't think uh, it was justified in what happened to them. The Japanese got 1.5 billion for their in internment. Uh, the Holocaust victims got 3.5 billion and they actually revoked Field R15. So we didn't get our 40 acres that was promised. So, uh, so again, yeah, I just wanted to make that statement. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. that. I'm oh, sorry. I don't okay. Know. Patrick, can you mute yourself? <clears throat> yeah, it's okay. okay. Oh, I just wanted to briefly say I totally understand your sentiment. And now I was one of the task force members who were um, you know, all about let's make sure we're centering, you know, um those who are impacted um, you know, by you know, over 250 years of enslaved labor and the badges and incidents of slavery, which are African Americans, those who are descendants of slaves. Um, on the way here, I'm from LA, I'm from Lumber Park, but I took the streets here. I've been taking the streets lately because it's like when you become more conscious, right? Like through this task force's recommendation and through our study, you know, and then also I just want to recommend an article from The Guardian by Sam Levin, which you all probably found out about, um, you know, detailing the history of, of, of exclusion in Santa Monica, where he said in Santa Monica, the I-10 freeway displaced roughly 600 predominantly Black families in the 1950s. Um, one uh, house destroyed had belonged to Nick Galvedon, the first documented Black and Mexican-American surfer in Santa Monica, 
Um, so yeah, as you all know, this article just goes into depth in terms of how, you know, specifically Black Americans who descend from slaves have been um, displaced via decades of, uh, of exclusionary public policy. So I say all that to say, um, you know, I am going to continue to center, you know, Black Americans who descend from slaves um, in this conversation around reparations. And I'll only say, you know, I think we have that urge to include everyone because that's just our nature. We we're very, um, you know, um, open and we want to bring everyone along with us. And I think that we um, should never lose that quality. Um, I think the narrative needs to be, look, you all, uh, as Black Americans, we brought along so many different groups. Now it's time for some reciprocity. Now it's time for other groups to help us in our, in our particular fight. And you referenced um, the situation here in Santa Monica. There's a recent book out, and it's titled Black California Dreaming. And uh, Allison Rose, uh, Allison Rose Jefferson, uh, he does have an unveiling of that book on this past Friday night at the California African American Museum. And it was hosted by KCRW. And the um, the books that Allison puts out focuses very clearly on what has happened here in Santa Monica. And um, I, I just want to give her book some publicity <laughs> because I think her writing is excellent. Her documentation and her research is outstanding. And it tells a story, another one of the stories that needs to be told. I don't think um, that um, by looking at what has happened to marginalized populations and, and saying that in, full, in a full-throated way um, diminishes the need to put a focus on what has happened to African Americans in this country. It's in the newspaper, uh, it's in headlines, it's on the news constantly. That is something that people cannot be mistaken about. What we do in uh, certain types of environments serves not only uh, any student who comes through the door, and I'll speak for education and higher education, we serve our respective communities. And we serve students who come and come across other communities to get to uh, to get to ours. And I'll, I'll speak for SNC. We have students who come from a lot of different places across uh, Southern California to come to Santa Monica College. Uh, we are not afraid to look at what the needs are for African American students. Mm -hmm. But I also know that um, it is important from where I sit. Uh, as, as a, a member of a community that has been marginalized, it's hard for me to look at other communities be marginalized too, and not speak to that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's who I am. Uh, and I think just as, as Black communities have been ignored, I don't want to be in a position where I'm ignoring injustices that are taking place around me with other uh, groups of people. That doesn't mean that I'm going to put African Americans after anyone else. I'm going to always make sure that I try to look out for my family. That's um, that's my perspective as an educator. But I'm also not going to be um, if what is it? If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I don't want to be part of the problem and contribute to mistreatment of any other group or neglect of any other group. Right. Okay, so we're at the phase now yeah. of, um, yeah, did you have one more question? question. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I, 
I'm Danny Kinsaka. Um, I was born in London. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, then I moved to Los Angeles. So I think for me, my perspective being 100% African, I'm wondering where that narrative comes into this whole picture. So I think anything that negatively impacts African Americans also impacts Africans. In America, I'm seen as African American, whether or not I'm a descendant of um, slaves. So I just wonder what that narrative looks like for people of African who are African who are living in America. <laughs> so, in terms of the task force final report, uh, most of our recommendations are uh, designed uh, for descendants of enslaved uh, people, particularly. But there are some recommendations that are, um, you know, I guess constructed on the basis of race, like the creation of black wellness centers that are supposed to uh, help to improve uh, mental um, and um, you know, physical um, health of Black people, generally speaking, and there are recommendations in our final report that are actually universal um, in nature that would benefit all, you know, Californians, no matter, you know, race, creed, um, or religion. But um, I just want to kind of stay true to what the lady was saying in terms of when we talk about reparations, um, you know, we're talking about a sacred political project. It was started by you know, enslaved Africans like the Linda Sutton, Callie Powell, um, you know, Isaiah Dickerson, um, and the progenitors of that movement are, you know, the descendants of those enslaved Africans, like the Black Panther Party, like Queen Mother Olive Moore, like present day uh, reparations advocates, advocates um, ourselves. So that's not to negate exactly what she said, that no matter, you know, your national origin, all Black people, um, face anti-blackness in some way. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, but when we're talking about reparations, we're talking about a particular group of people. Um, it's a debt that's owed. And we're also talking about the lingering badges and incidents of slavery that still predominantly um, disproportionately impact African Americans. Um, a concrete example of that um, is if you disaggregate the data in terms of the wealth gap in Los Angeles. Um, white Los Angelinos, for instance, have an average wealth gap of around $110,000 in Los Angeles. Compare that to African Blacks of immigrant origin, it's around $72,000. Compare that to Black Americans who do descend from slaves, it's about $100. And so, if, you know, Black Americans who do descend from slaves, you know, are you know, our wealth position in the city of Los Angeles and the state of California and the United States, despite this massive gaslighting campaign that has been enacted against my people for hundreds of years, our position is not because of any um, inherent deficiency. It's because of decades of exclusionary public policy that has, um, despite our resilience, despite us being just amazing people who have, um, you know, uh, worked hard despite what's been against us. You know, this exclusionary public policy is the reason why we have the wealth position that we have now. So, not to say that you know, black people who aren't black Americans don't face anti-blackness, but we're talking about, you know, decades, decades of exclusionary public policy on top of. 255 years of forced labor that has just completely crushed our position in this country and has relegated us to the bottom half of this society. I think it's really important to, um, to look at the distinction between the specific issue related to reparations in California and affirmative action as a separate item. And there are other topics we can also look at that probably slice this up in different ways. Uh, because in, in talking about these two particular topics today, uh, or uh, tonight for the purpose of this, this conversation, um, there are some things that overlap, but there are some things that are very clear boundaries mm -hmm. as well. So I really appreciate your distinction you. and your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, James, do you have a final comment? Uh, on that point, our period. <laughs> I, I, I got a message. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you all my final points then and I'll be done. Uh, to my brother from Nigeria, 
by way of London, uh, we're going to ask uh, England for reparations from Nigeria as well, yeah, from colonization and all that. So, yeah, you, you know, uh, I'm a Pan-Africanist. So, yeah, absolutely. We're going to be behind you to get yours, too. Um, I, I, I had a couple of points. Uh, I, one of the, I've been watching the, the task force meetings on YouTube. And one of the things that came up that bothered me was the lack of support from not only Californians, but from the nation. And I think one way we can resolve that, because again, America's a capitalist country, is people don't want to give up their money. They don't want to pay their taxes for our reparations, even though they might be for reparations. So I think, you know, we could have scholars, we could have historians, we could have the I IRS, we can have DNA people, and we can go specifically after those who are descendants of the slave master as we find out who is the descendant of the slave. So we can get like Thomas Jefferson is a perfect example. You know, his descendants, they did the DNA. They found out those were his great, 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 whatever grandchildren. And they didn't even want the money. They didn't lost their damn mind. So uh, again, uh, I think we, uh, me and Angela will, will definitely want to get the fraternities and sororities involved. Uh, the Masons, Lynx, Shriners, all our Black artists. I just don't understand why we ain't really jumped behind this movement for reparations. And uh, finally, if the legislation does not pass after all your hard work, sister, <laughs> uh, I, I do, the Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. And maybe the governor can just sign an executive order giving us our millions. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, I just want to say this is on YouTube, y'all. So tell all your friends mm -hmm. that they can go to YouTube and get this. Mm -hmm. Every time we do, every time we do a workshop, we do YouTube. And so you, it's it's safe. You can go in and just look, see our put in CRJ, right, Janet? And um, every month, we've been doing these every month for over 10 12, years, 12 years, 12 years now. Wow. Okay, I'm trying to limit things. Um, <laughs> my age. <laughs> so, you know, so do, um, you know, not only check us out every month, because we have those topics of mental health. Don't we, Angela? I mean, Angela has some amazing speakers she brings in. I mean, we all bring in different speakers and to speak to the topics. And um, the California Reparations Committee, I must say, has been wonderful in always answering our calls, as well as Dr. Jeff Reese, who always comes when we, when we call, when we ask. And I appreciate that. James, if you're new to the family, but we'll be calling on you again. Um, it's just... Um, we got to get the word out. Like Jim said, why aren't we behind this movement? I mean, everybody that I talked to was saying, we want our reparations, but have you come to meetings? Have you, what do you know about, you know, the whole project? Did I see something else online? No, actually? Just no just talk. Yeah. No, you did. Um, Darlene raised a question, which I, I believe uh, Ms. Camila uh, answered it yes, very yes. Yeah. Um, and that was a basic question regarding how are they doing the tracing of all enslaved individuals within California? But I think it's more, um, I think it's more broader than that, right? If I'm not mistaken, Ms. Camilla. So the stand um, to be eligible for reparations, you have to be a descendant of an of, of enslaved Black person or a free Black person living in the United States prior to 1900. Um, so in order to show your eligibility, that's something that the new state agency that we're recommending uh, would be responsible for. Uh, there would be, you know, hiring a board certified genealogist. There would be an eligibility and genealogy office because the idea is that burden of proof, so to speak, should not rest on the individual. It should rest on the state. There should be resources allocated to help with that. Um, African Americans, a lot of us have already done this work on our own. We have like a family historian in each of our little families, and people kind of already doing this work. Henry Louis Gates just came out of the groundbreaking project called 10 Million Faces. Um, you all should look that up on social media, where now you can go online and put your um, 
Uh, you, they'll help you, but if you already have your records, you can put that online. It's going to be a, na a nationwide repository, a lineage uh, genealogy repository, where you can, you know, find essentially your ancestors. Resources like that are going to be very, very helpful. But the new state agency is going to be responsible for that. Oh, quick. Just let me ask Angela a question real quick. Angela, do you have all that in the chat? about the, the organization. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna save the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're saving the chat. And if you guys don't have all the, the links and the information that was given, um, you can uh, request it from us and we can get it to you. Um, I also wanna say in regards to uh, Dr. Jefferson mentioning Allison Rose Jefferson, Allison was the first uh, historian that came here and helped us to uh, designate our first African-American property, which was uh, CMA, CME Church, Phillips Chapel on 4th Street. And then since then, she also helped us do the Belmar, and she has an amazing exhibit as uh, Dr. Jeffrey says, uh, Joanne and I went Friday night. I know Joanne, but I got to tell you this. It's kind of close, but I got to tell you, you need to go see that exhibit. That exhibit is at CAM, the African American Museum over by USC. Mm -hmm. It's going to be there for a minute, but don't wait till the last minute to go see it. It's, it is just, it talks about Venice and Santa Monica and the relationship between Venice and Santa Monica. It's all about the coast. Mostly, the majority of it is about the coastal cities and what happened with the coastal cities. You will learn a lot. But if you buy her book, and she'll probably be there with some, so she, you can get it signed. But if not, you can go online and get her book as well. And if you put in Allison Rose Jefferson, she has a lot and lot of writings about what happened here in Santa Monica. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes. Does the exhibit include military information? I'm the daughter of one of the actual highly honored to be the airmen. And we are actually looking up our parents' information in regards to the reparation, affirmative action, and college, because we're continual college students also honor students. And we have a lot of research to do on it to see the airmen because they're passing away. Also, because a lot of the items on the internet are not accurate. Ancestry.com is not accurate. A lot of that information on the internet is not accurate. Okay. And we're not going to install our information on some of these websites because people are illegally victimizing us by criminal complex identity. That's also now my father actually used to tell us that we are African, Seminole Indian, American. Okay. We have information from our family members, but we're looking for accuracy where we don't have to type in our information on a website that we may not be able to trust. So maybe you can talk to us more about that when this meeting is over. No, the exhibit is, is specifically Allison Rose Jefferson and her findings throughout the coastal area from Bruce's Beach, Huntington Beach, and definitely a lot of information in Santa Monica because I work with her personally on a lot of that as well. And so um, I just wanted to, you know, say those two things. And Dr. Jeffrey, you have one more thing that you want to say? No? No? Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to thank you all for coming to see our day. Please keep coming back. You know, if you don't come to the league, you don't get the information, and you really can't close about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, this is where you get it. We are the only game in town that does this kind of stuff. You will not get that in town, Monica. So let me tell you guys how we close out. Everybody stand to your feet. Try to form a circle if you can. Draw right, the circle. Everybody can in a circle. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
We must love and protect one another. We must love, we must and, love and protect one, one another. another. Okay, a little bit louder. I know it's late in the evening. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty, our duty to fight for freedom. freedom. We must love and protect one another. We must we love, love and protect one another. another. Well, uh, city Hall here today. I need them to hear this down in the yard, Fourth Street. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. Love and respect one another. We must love, 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 love one and another. Respect one another. One another. Thank you all our speakers. Thanks for hearing my Thank you 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 for